You've decided to split, but you're still living together. Whether it goes on for days, weeks, or months, being stuck under the same roof when you're no longer a romantic couple can be stressful, especially if you have kids. In this video, I'll share my 11 tips for surviving the divorce limbo phase. Hi, I'm Kate Scharf. I'm a psychotherapist, a family mediator, and a divorce consultant with about 30 years experience helping individuals and families survive and thrive through the divorce process. There are lots of reasons that divorcing couples get stuck under the same roof. Some folks need time to figure out who will stay in the marital home and who will move out. Others are wisely reluctant to make a move before they have a signed custody agreement and maybe a financial agreement too. In today's economy, the most common reason that divorcing couples wind up living together longer than they might otherwise is that they now need to figure out how to stretch their finances to support two households when it's been hard enough to support just one. Often that means selling the marital home and that can take time, both for logistical and emotional reasons. For most people, getting through this in-between period is one of the most emotionally confusing, complicated, difficult parts of the whole divorce process. To give you a sense of what I mean, here are three made up but pretty typical examples of how my clients have described the limbo phase. Here's divorcing person number one. At first, I didn't want her to leave. I thought she might change her mind about the divorce, but she's sleeping in the guest room and it hurts so much I can't stand it. Last night I yelled at her for being late for dinner. That doesn't even make any sense. I mean, we're getting divorced. Here's divorcing person number two. We don't know how long it'll take for us to sell our house. And until we have answers, we don't want to tell the kids that we're splitting up. So we're acting like nothing's changed. But really, there's this invisible piano suspended over all of our heads. And here's divorcing person number three. I cannot stand the sight of him. If he doesn't move out soon, well, all I can say is it's a good thing we don't own a gun. It can be wrenching. After all, mere weeks or even days ago, you shared everything. Time with your kids, a social life, a bathroom, a bed. Suddenly, it's awkward when you accidentally reach for the same fork. Whether the very sight of each other induces nausea or you've achieved a fragile civility, you'll feel that you're in a surreal new world. Now, I am about to share my 11 tips for surviving the divorce limbo phase, but before I do, I'm gonna take a second for a very important public service announcement. Even if you want to keep things civil, which I think is great, I completely support that, never agree on a plan to move out of your house or on a custody schedule or a financial agreement without first consulting an attorney. No matter how well thought out your plan is, there may be important potential legal implications that you can't anticipate. Okay, here are those tips I promised you. Number one, create guidelines for interacting. The clearer you are about your mutual expectations, the less room there will be for hard feelings to develop. So even if it feels kind of silly or sad after all these years of living together, sit down now and hash out the specifics. Will the running of your household stay pretty much the same for now or will it change? If so, who will cook, clean, pay bills? Will you continue to spend time together as a family or will each of you have separate, dedicated time with the kids now? Will you share groceries or each buy your own? How will you handle any holidays that crop up between now and the time you're living apart? Walk through the specific details of your life and try to address as many of them as you can. But of course, you can't anticipate everything, so proactively discuss any new issues as they come up. Number two, decide what you'll tell your friends, your acquaintances, and your extended family. Will you continue for now to present yourselves as a couple? Will you make your long-term plans public? If so, to whom? Of course, each of you will need to confide in some trusted others, like your best friend or your family, but give some thought to this because whatever message you put out publicly or to anyone that you can't really trust to keep it to themselves will probably find its way back to your kids. And you don't want them to find out that their parents are getting divorced from some kid at school. Number three, respect the need for space. In divorce, it's rare that both people cross the emotional finish line at the same time. 
So one of you will likely want more interaction than the other right now. If your spouse becomes nasty or ignores you when you just ask them about their day, stop asking. You may hate the ensuing silence, but really loneliness is less painful than ongoing rejection. Plus, if you push too hard, your future ex will become increasingly resentful. And now isn't a good time to squander the goodwill that you'll need going forward because you've still got a lot of tough decisions to make together. And if you have kids, not only will the tension spill over onto them now, it'll compromise your co-parenting relationship going forward. Number four, don't be confused if things go well. It's a cruel irony, but with the pressure to stay married off the table, the two of you may find yourselves getting along better than you have in years. It'll help if you remind yourselves that the troubles haven't gone into spontaneous remission. This is a temporary lull. Keep in mind, too, that if your kids have experienced a period of uncharacteristic peacefulness in the period of time just before you do tell them about the divorce, the news may feel more confusing to them. So if things play out this way, it might be helpful when you talk to your kids to address the issue directly in a way that is geared to their ages and their ability to understand things. Number five, don't force family time. If you're getting along, it's fine to continue co-parenting in the same old way for now. But if family dinner feels like a scene from War of the Roses, change course. Number six, consider an in-house separation. If things are awkward or acrimonious, or if you just want to start easing into your new schedule now, which is common and often a good idea, try dividing time with the kids, perhaps approximating the weekly schedule that you're planning to use post-split. When you're not with the kids, in other words, off-duty, make yourself scarce. Go to the gym, visit a friend, take the opportunity to go in early or stay later at work. But be prepared. The inevitable overlap, the time when you and your spouse are both at home, will create moments of confusion and perhaps resentment. For example, if your child asks you to help with homework on your off time, are you going to say, sorry, I'm off the clock? No, of course not. But still, your spouse may feel that you're infringing on their time. Number seven, consider bird nesting, or nesting as it's usually called. This is an arrangement where the kids stay put in your home and the two of you rotate in and out on a schedule. The idea is that when either of you is the off-duty parent, you'll live and sleep elsewhere, maybe with relatives or a friend or in a rented apartment. It sounds good on paper. I mean, theoretically, it's much, much less disruptive for the kids. And it's true that some families find nesting works well, and some do it for years, but they're in the tiny minority. Most people find nesting super stressful and unsustainable for more than a few weeks or months. One reason is that they feel nomadic. Another is that if two people are using the same apartment when they're not with the kids, which a lot of people do to save money, both feel they have no space of their own. And then there's the inevitable bickering at the changeover from one parent to the other. Did someone leave a mountain of dirty laundry, unwashed dishes, an empty fridge, a fourth grader's unfinished science project? You get the idea. Number eight, exercise discretion around dating. If you're already in another relationship, especially if it's the reason for your breakup or your spouse thinks it is, any evidence of that will be excruciating. If you're not dating but you're desperate to start, consider your emotional context. Maybe you and your spouse are already in the friend zone and he or she will be really okay with it, but given how fresh things are, that's not likely. And if you have kids, they haven't even had time to wrap their heads around the idea of the divorce. They may not even know about it yet. So they're definitely not up for learning about any new romantic activity. So if you must date before you're in separate dwellings, be discreet. Do it on your off time. Don't bring a new significant other to the marital home, even if no one else is there. And when you are with your kids, whether your spouse is there or not, don't act like a teenager. Don't spend time texting or in the other room, talking on the phone in a hushed tone. They will definitely pick that up. Number nine. Be thoughtful about what and when to tell the kids. Because the first question that kids have about divorce is usually very practical and basic. Who's moving? When? Where? When will we see you both? Can I stay in my school? Can my dog go back and forth with me? I usually recommend holding off on telling the kids about the divorce until parents are pretty much 
ready with most of the basic answers. But children are emotional sponges and they are exquisitely tuned in to you. So they won't be fooled into thinking it's business as usual when it isn't for long. So in the absence of real answers, they'll make up their own, which are going to be scarier than the reality. Most kids imagine that whatever's going on is their fault. So if your limbo phase extends into months, it might be kinder to give your kids the information you have, even if it's partial. Telling your kids that you're planning to divorce, but working on the particulars and reassuring them that you'll give them the specifics as soon as you can, including a move out date, will protect them from the crazy feeling that they would get from knowing in their gut that something is wrong, but not getting validation from you. Number 10, get help if you need it. Most couples, regardless of their level of conflict, low, medium, high, need some help navigating the limbo phase. So consider hiring a mental health consultant who specializes in divorce to help you think through the logistical, emotional, and parenting issues. If you're already working with a lawyer or two lawyers, ask them for a referral. Good family law attorneys know the value of multidisciplinary collaboration and will probably have a list of qualified folks in your hometown. Finally, keep the limbo phase as short as you can. Your divorce won't become fully real for you or for your kids until you're separated into two households. For kids and for a spouse who doesn't want the divorce, a long period of cohabitation keeps the fantasy of reconciliation painfully alive. A real separation allows space for each of you to become truly emotionally divorced and for your whole family to go through the necessary process of grieving, recovering, and getting on with the rest of your lives. I hope you found this video helpful. I invite you to subscribe to this channel. That way you'll hear from me when I've got a new video or blog post. And speaking of blog posts, please visit my blog at divorceonplanetearth.com. There's more stuff there about divorce and relationships and the other stuff that I like to think and write about. You can follow me on Facebook at Divorce for Humans. That's divorce number four, humans. If there is a divorce related or parenting related uh, issue that you're concerned about and that I haven't weighed in on yet, tweet me or drop me a line at info at divorceonplanter.com. I would love to hear from you. Thanks for watching.